Okay, so I left you guys with one problem yet that I wanted to work on yet out of that packet. And that was letter B on the sills and joists and flooring packet. So that one looks like this. Oops. And the reason I wanted to go through this one is because it has some things in it that are my scale drawing is way off, but that's okay. It has a couple of things in it that are worth pointing out. So you've got 18, 18, and 20 here for, for distances. This down here is 30 feet. And it gives us that across here, it's 26 feet. Oh, sorry. Thank you. There you go. That might make more sense when you can see me. You bet. Okay, so looking at sills, again, the sills are pretty simple. The sills are just equal to the perimeter. Now, on the other ones, we just kind of doubled the sides. This one, because there's an indented piece here, it's not just a corner. We're going to have to be a little more careful on how we add up the perimeter. Um, this piece here is the difference between 32 and 26. That's going to be 6 feet. This piece here will be the difference between 30 and 26. So that will be 4 feet. Then over on this side, we're going to add up the 18, 18, and 20 to get 56 feet. So for our perimeter, I'm going to start with the 56. 56 plus 32 plus 18 plus 6 plus 18 plus the 4 plus 20 and plus the 30 on bottom. So as we add those up, let's see here, we've got 56, 88, 106, 112, 130, 134, 184. So 180 feet of sills is required to go around that foundation. Now again, we're not doing the girders or the beam, so we're going to jump from there to our joists. I believe I had mentioned to assume that this beam was at 16 feet at the mid-span of this longest span. So the span here is 16 feet. The run, on this side, the run is the full 56 feet. So those are 16 foot joists that we're going to need there. Sixteen footers, we need to figure out how many. So our number of joists is going to equal. Now we're assuming that those joists are going. Did I give you the did I say 16 or 24 on those? I think I said 24, didn't I? So 12 over 24 times that run of 56, plus 1, plus 0, or minus 1, for just this run here. Plus 1, very good. We do need a joist on each end. So that's going to be 12, 12 over 24 times 56 is 28, plus 1 is 29. Is there anywhere else where we have 16-foot joists? Right here we do. So now we've got to choose an end since 18 is not modular. 18 is not divisible by 4. Now since we're going 2 foot on center instead of 16 inches on center, it will work out at 18 feet. So it should be okay. But what we do is we pick an end and we're going to run the joist from that end. So we're going to, since we're dealing with 16 footers, we'll start there and we'll come down. Our run then for the 16 footers here is that 18 feet. So we've got to figure out our number of joists there. So it's 12 over 24 times the 18 foot run. Now before we can figure out whether we're going to add one or zero or subtract one here, 
let's figure out what we get here. 12 24 times 18 is 9. Now that comes out to be a whole number. If that were a decimal or a fraction, that's telling us that the lat, that a joist does not line up at the end here. Since that came out to be in a whole number, that tells us that the last joist does come exactly at the end here. So what that's telling us is that there is a joist at this end. Do we need a joist at this end? Yes or no? Yeah. So we do need one at each end, so this is going to be a plus 1. So 9 plus 1 is going to be 10 joists there. So our 16-foot joists, we need 29 and 10 makes 39 of those. What's the next length of joist that we need? We keep going down here. Let's look at this section here. What length joist are we going to need there? It's 26 feet all the way across here. And we put 16 foot joists here. So what length is left over here? 10 feet. Good. So we need to find 10 foot joists. So the run of those 10 foot joists down through here is that 18 foot section. So our number of joists is either 12 over 24 times 18 feet. Again, we don't know what to put here quite yet. Well, 12 over 24 times 18 is 9. It does come out to be a whole number. So that tells us that a joist would come out right on the end of this. But do since it comes out right on the end, would we want to put a 10-foot joist here? Why would we not want to put a 10-foot joist there? We'd want to run it all the way out to the end here, wouldn't we? So then we don't have to put an end joist right here. Otherwise, we'd have to do something to fill that in. So we do not want one on this end. Do we want one on this end? No, we already have the other one, the one from the eight, the 16 foot span there. So this is actually going to be a minus one because we do not need a joist at either end. So minus one means there's eight joists. So for the 10 footers, we only need eight of those 10 foot joists. Then our final one here, this is going to be 14 foot span on a 20 foot run. Can you tell me right now, do we need joists at both ends? Yes, we are going to need a joist at each end of that. So that is going to be a plus one. So number of joists equals 12 over 24 times 20 plus one. 12 over 24 is Time, or 12 over 24 times 20 is 10, plus 1 is 11. So we need 11 of the 14-foot joists. So there's our list of joists. Did anybody get that list? Okay. Are there any? What's that? Okay. Does anybody have questions on where that list come from or anybody that's totally lost on where any of those numbers come from? Okay, guys, so this is a big skill to have. I realize for you guys, you're just kind of getting an introduction to stuff right now, so don't necessarily expect you to have this mastered right now, but this is one that hopefully you will pick up as time goes on. Now for the flooring, actually, I got to do bridging first, don't I? Let me get some of my mess out of here for bridging. Bridging we can kind of combine all as one. This side I need bridging all the way down the side because those are all 16 foot joists. Do I need bridging all the way down this side? No. What's our magic length? If we're that length or less, we don't need bridging? It's 10 feet, yes. 
So this section here, those are 10 foot joists. So we do not need bridging there. So the run of our bridging, we have, oops. So for the run of our bridging, we have the 56 feet over here, 18 feet over here, and 20 feet. So we can just do... For the bridging, to find our run, 56 plus 18 plus 20 is, what, 74, 94 feet. So the amount of bridging needed is 94 feet times 3, or 3 times 94, however you want to look at it. That is 282 feet of that 1 by 3 bridging material. Last thing is flooring. So to do this, to do the flooring, we need to know the area of the floor. Now I'm just going to go ahead and do this one the way the packet does it, rather than doing it my way with it where I modularize the dimensions. What the packet's doing is just finding the area and dividing by 32, and then later. Um, if you were to continue with packets out of the same book, they add that 10% waste to it. That 10% waste accounts for the fact that this isn't modular. Okay, so I'm just going to cut this into three rectangles like that. This one is 32 by 18. Otherwise known as what? 576 square feet. This one here is 18 by 26. 648 square feet. This one here is 30 by 20. Or 600 square feet. So the floor area five seventy six plus six forty eight plus six hundred fourteen eight twelve so one thousand eight hundred and twenty four square feet of floor area. How do I figure out how many sheets of sheeting I need? Somebody be brave. What do I do to figure out how many sheets of the 4x8 four flooring I need? 32. Very good. The area of a piece of flooring is 4x8. Four that's 32 square feet. So it's 57 sheets. And now, like I said, um, the, if you went on, if we continued with packets out of this book, they would say add 10% to that. The quick way to add 10% is to multiply by 1.10. That's 110%. We're not going to worry about that for right now. We're just going to say it was 57 sheets. The other method of doing it would involve modularizing the dimensions, and I'm not going to go through that right now because I think I probably really lost you guys when I was doing that. So we're going to hold off on that. We'll do the simple way. Okay, so we're going to let go of the estimating side for now. So we're done with those packets. So you guys can put those away if you want to. Um, I would recommend holding on to them rather than throwing them away because it's something good to go back and look at if this is an industry you do want to continue on in. Um, they're good resources to have to remember some of those basics. <clears throat> so we're going to look now at another use of our variables. We were using variables in our formulas there for the first few classes. Today we're going to look at using variables as just a symbol within an expression.
So we might have just 4x. That's an algebraic number. This behaves just like having 4 inches or 4 cows or anything else. If you remember back to last semester, we talked about all numbers have two parts. There's a count that tells us how many and a name that tells us of what. So 4 inches means we have 4 and what we have are inches. We know what an inch is. Four cows, again, we know what a cow is, and we have four of them. Where this, the algebraic numbers become a little less comfortable is, we don't know what an x is, but we do know we have four of them here. And it doesn't matter what the x is, it behaves exactly the same way as any other name. So if we have 4x plus 7x, when we add or subtract, Remember, one, we need the same name, must have the same name. And then, of course, we're always going to combine the counts, but when we add or subtract, we keep the same name. So over here, we combine the counts. Four and seven make... What's 4 plus 7? 11. And we keep the same name, so the x stays x. Just like if we had 4 inches plus 7 inches, it would be 11 inches. If I had 6x plus 9y, what do I get? Careful. Remember when I had like six feet plus nine pounds? I ended up with six feet and nine pounds, right? Same thing here. I get six X and nine Y. I cannot combine those with addition or with subtraction because they have different names. Okay. <laughs> No problem. So, if we're multiplying, however, remember when we multiply or divide, we do not need the same name. Because we're still going to combine the counts, but we're going to also combine the names. So if I have the 4x times 7x, I'm going to combine the counts. 4 and 7, now we're multiplying, so we combine the counts with multiplication. 4 times 7 is 28. And I'm also going to combine the names. X times X is... X squared. Just like inches times inches became inches squared. And now if we have... Let's do 6X times 9Y. We're going to combine the counts. 6 times 9 is 54. Good. And x times y is just xy. So when we're multiplying, we do not have to have the same name because we're going to combine the names. Remember back that course kind of corresponded if we had like 5 feet times 3 pounds. 5 times 3 is 15. Feet times pounds became foot pounds. In construction, by the way, foot pounds is a very important unit. When you start talking about analyzing beams, um, the bending in a beam 
is calculated in foot pounds. It's called bending moment. And if you look at like eye joists or anything like that that you're going to order and use, they will be listed. They'll have a maximum bending moment. So at some point you'll look at figuring out what is that bending moment that's generated on a load sitting on those beams or joists. <laughs> okay, now I want to step back for a minute and look at our numbering systems for just a second. Look at our place values here. Now I'm just going to put in the numbers here. This is just one, ten, hundreds, one thousands, ten thousands. Now I'm putting in just the numbers here for a reason. Because I want to show where those numbers come from. We mentioned this briefly um, last semester, and I want to really kind of spend some time with it. Because there's a few things we're going to do over the next couple of months that rely on understanding these place values. Our number system is what we call a decimal number system. Decimal number system or a base 10 number system. What base 10 is referring to is an exponent. Remember we have like 3 to the power of 5? That's an exponent. The 3 is the base of the exponent. The 5 is the power. <clears throat> so, each of these place values comes from an exponent with a base of 10. Now, 10 to the power of 1 is pretty easy to see as 10. The 1's place is actually 10 to the power of 0. Anything to the power of 0 equals 1. The 100's place is 10 to the power of 2. That's 100. 10 to the power of 3 is 1,000. Th and I really screwed this up here, didn't I? Sure, so that's 10,000's and 100,000's. So this is 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5. So there we go, that's a little bit better. Uh, so all of our place values here are powers of 10. Now we had looked at, at the beginning of last semester, if we have something like 3,852. We wrote that in an expanded form. 3,000s and 800s and 510s and 2-1s. Okay, good. So, there's, a, there's an alternative way of writing this. Instead of 3,000s, we can write 3 times 10 to the, the thousands place is 10 to the third. Plus, 800s is 8 times 10 to the second. The tens, that would be 5 times 10 to the first, or just 5 times 10. And then 2, two ones would be 2 times 10 to the 0. Or a lot of times we would just write 2 there without any, any 10 power of 10 there at all. But when we look at this number like this, it might look really strange to us. But we can see an equivalency between that and an algebraic number. Like I might have 5x to the third plus 7x squared plus 9x plus 3. It'll take some getting used to, but this algebraic number is just a number with a different base. Instead of having our place values being powers of 10, our place values are powers of x. This is the x to the 0 place, or the 1's place. This is the x to the 1. This is the x squared. This is the x to the thirds. So you can see there's a correspondence here. Instead of 3 times 10 to the third, this is 5 times x to the third. 
Instead of 8 times x to the second, this is 7 times x, or sorry, instead of 8 times 10 to the second, this is 7 times x to the second. Instead of 5 times 10 to the 1, or just 5 times 10, this is 9 times x, or 9 times x to the 1. And then we have our 10 to the 0 and x to the 0 digit that's just that number left. So when we work with these algebraic numbers, the way we work with them is going to be exactly the same as the way we work with whole numbers. The difference is our algebraic numbers must always be written out in this expanded form. There is no shortcut for putting the, the powers of x in our place values. A second difference is in our, our integers, either the whole, the Every digit of the number is positive or every digit is negative. For example, negative 293. That is a negative 200 and a negative 9 tens and a negative 3 ones. Every digit of that is negative. But with an algebraic number, we can have 8x squared minus 5x plus 7. So you can see here it's possible for just one digit to be negative on its own, or each digit can be positive or negative all on its own in that algebraic number. So let's do some operations with these algebraic numbers. We're going to start out with single digits for a while. We've already looked at like 5x plus 7x makes 12x or whatever. What if we have something a little more complicated? Can I combine, what do I get when I combine 5x plus 8y? I get 5x plus 8y, right? We can't combine those because they have different names. But if I go a little bit further with it, like this, well, again, there's different names there. But we can still combine. We can combine the things that are the same name. I can combine the 5x with the 7x. That makes what? Careful. 5 and 7 makes 12x, right? Then I've got 8y and 3y combined to make 11y. Now, one thing you'll notice is there's nothing in between them here right now. We have to have a symbol connecting them. This is a positive 11y, so I'm just going to put a plus in there to connect those two algebraic digits. The name that's often used for an algebraic digit is a term. Now, all of these were positive. In this next step, I'm going to look at some of them being negative. So 9x plus 13y minus 7x minus 5y. Now this, students look at this and ask me, is that addition or is that positive? The answer is yes. It's addition, but it's telling us that this is a positive 13y. The same here. Is that subtraction or is that a negative? Well, it could be. It is subtraction, but I can think of this. It goes with the number or the digit that comes after it. I can think of that as being a negative 7x. So this can be thought of as being a negative 5y. So when I go to combine here, I have 9x is going to combine with the negative 7x. What is 9 and negative 7? Remember, the picture looks like that. Positive 9, back negative 7, it is 2, right? 2. Perfect. So that's 2x. Now I have the 13y and negative 5y. There's 13, negative 5. What does that end up at? What's 13 minus 5? 8. 8. Perfect. So that's 8y. What symbol am I going to have to put in between them here? 
Well, it's a positive 8, right? It's going to be plus. So what I want you to do in your notes, I'm going to take like 20 seconds and quick combine those terms for me. So what combines with the 13x? Is it 12x? It's not a 12x, it's a, it's a negative 12x. So 13 and negative 12. So positive 13, negative 12, where does it end up at? 1, so it's 1x. Now, a lot of times, instead of writing 1x, we just write x. We talked about this last week. Sometimes if we have just an inch, instead of saying 1 inch, we just say an inch. So now we've got 5y and negative 9y. Positive 5, negative 9. Where do we end up? Negative 4. Negative 4y. Now, here you see... Since that's a negative 4y, that negative just becomes a subtraction between it's x minus 4y. Is there a difference between x minus 4y and x plus a negative 4y? Absolutely not. They mean exactly the same thing. This is just a shorter way of writing, more convenient way of writing. Okay, so now let's take a look at a little bit more complicated algebraic numbers instead of just combining single digits. So here's a three-digit algebraic number like we were looking at a little while ago. The parentheses are not telling us to do anything in there first. It's not like an order of operations thing. That's just separating that out and saying that is a single number. So we're adding that to a second algebraic number. <clears throat> a lot of your algebra textbooks tell you, well, if you're adding, you just drop the parentheses and combine like terms. And that works just fine. But I'm going to show you an alternative. These, as we saw before, are structured just like our whole numbers. So there's no reason that we can't add them just like our whole numbers. So we're going to take that 3x squared plus 7x plus 12. And then we're going to take our second number here and we're going to write it underneath, lining up the columns. Just like we line up the columns when we add whole numbers. So the 4x squared goes under the 3x squared. The 2x goes under the 7x. The 8 goes under the 12. And now we are adding down our columns. So 12 plus 8 is... Twenty, very good. So it's a positive plus twenty. It's a positive twenty. Seven x plus two x is nine x, and it's positive again. So I'm gonna put a plus in front of it. Three x squared and four x squared. Seven x squared. Now it's positive, but I don't need a plus in front of it because there's no other terms in front of it. So that's it. Seven x squared plus nine x plus twenty. So our algebraic numbers behave exactly like our whole numbers do. Now it gets a little more complicated. As I said, in our algebraic numbers, each individual digit can be positive or negative on its own. So the negatives can give us a little bit of an issue. So 
So let's take 5x squared minus 8x plus 11 plus 2x squared plus 9x minus 15. So again, we're just going to write this out, lining it up vertically. So I write out my 5x squared minus 8x plus 11. The 2x squared goes under the 5x squared. The positive 9x goes under the negative 8x. And the negative 15 goes under the positive 11. And we are adding down our columns again. So now we have, we have to deal with our negatives. We have 11 plus a negative 15. 11 plus a negative 15 is negative 4. Negative 4. Beautiful. Then we have negative 8x plus 9x. We have negative 8 plus 9 ends up being positive 1. So this is plus. I need to put plus 1x or I can just put plus x. I'm going to put just plus x. 5x, oh, somebody said it already. What is it? 7, good. 5x squared plus 2x squared is 7x squared. So there it is, 7x squared plus x minus 4. I'm going to have you guys try one of these in your notes. So 4x squared plus 9x minus 13 plus x squared minus 5x plus 7. Try that in your notes quick and we'll go over it in about a minute. Okay, so we're going to set it up just like before. We write out the 4x squared plus 9x minus 13. In the second number, we line up the x squared under the 4x squared, the negative 5x under the 9x, and the 7 under the negative 13. What is negative 13 plus 7? <coughs> negative 6, good. 9x. Plus a negative 5x. 9 plus negative 5. 4x. Good. So it's a positive 4x. I'll put a plus in front of it. Now here, 4x squared plus x squared is a little confusing. Remember, x squared is really 1x squared. So 4 plus 1 is 5x squared. Any questions? Okay, good. So before we take our break yet, I want to sh touch on subtraction. Okay, so I purposely put all the digits here positive to make this first example easier for us. We're going to set it up just like addition, lining up our columns. Oops, that should be squared there. So 3x squared plus 5x plus 8. This time we are subtracting down each column. So 12 minus 8 is 4. Good, it's positive 4. 8x minus 5x. 3x, so positive 3x. 5x squared minus 3x squared. 2x squared, good. That doesn't seem so bad, but 
all the digits were positive. Where these get confusing is when I throw in some negative digits in there. Like this. So we have 3x squared minus 9x plus 2, and we're subtracting from that 7x squared plus 5x minus 13. So we're going to set it up again, 3x squared minus 9x plus 2. The 7x squared goes under the 3x squared. Positive 5x goes under the negative 9x. Negative 13 goes under the positive 2. And we are subtracting. So now here's where we got to be very, very careful. 2 minus a negative 13. Remember, we are subtracting down the columns here. So this is 2 minus a negative 13. That becomes 2 plus what? 2 plus 13, which is just a positive 15. Here we've got negative 9x minus 5x. So we're going to do that negative 9 minus 5. Again, that's going to become negative 9 plus negative 5, right? Adding the opposite. So the opposite of positive 5 is a negative 5. So instead of subtracting a positive 5, we add a negative 5. So negative 9 and negative 5 make negative 14. So it's negative 14x. And then here, 3x squared minus 7x squared. What is 3 minus 7? Positive 3, take away 7. Negative 4, very good. Negative 4x squared. It is time for break, it looks like. So let's take about three minutes, give you guys a chance to move around and wake up a bit, and we'll start up in about three. Our, our next step then, guys, we've talked about addition and subtraction, so it only makes sense. We're going to hit multiplication. So we've talked a little bit about just simple multiplication, you know, the 5x times 7x. And how we're going to combine the counts, 5 and 7 combined with multiplication, make 35. Then we're also going to combine the names. x times x is x squared. <coughs> We've said we do not need the same name. That's why we were able to take 3x times 5y. And we can multiply those. Combining the counts, 3 times 5 is 15. And also combining the names, x times y is xy. Thank you. So then, um, stick with me, guys. So. There's other ways that we can have different names rather than just having different variables like x and y. For example, let's look at 3x squared and 7x. I like to take our variables and compare them back to solid things we know. And last semester we encountered measurements like 7 inches and three inches squared or three square inches. Can I add seven inches to three square inches? No, I can't because they're different things. An inch is a unit of length. An inch is a, a length just like that. A square inch is a unit of area. It's a size, a, a, a square, it's a block, it's a surface. So I cannot add 7 inches to 3 square inches. However, I can multiply 7 inches times 
three square inches because when I multiply, I don't need a name. And if you recall, that's one of the ways we calculated a volume is we might take an area that's three square inches and multiply it by a height of seven inches that gives us a volume. We're going to combine the counts. Seven times three makes 21. Then also combine the names. Inches times inches squared is inches cubed. So back to x squared and x. If I have 9x squared plus 5x, can I add those? No. In fact, from what we just saw, those are actually just two digits of the same number. We cannot really add those together. But if I have 9x squared times 5x, can I multiply them? Yeah, just like I did over here with the inches and inches squared, x's and x squareds can be multiplied. I do not need the same name to multiply. So, I multiply the counts. 9 times 5 makes... 45, good. X squared times X makes? X cubed. X cubed, or X to the third, very good. So I want to explore briefly those powers of the variables. We talked about this a little bit before, and we're talking about it a little bit more again. X to the third times X to the fifth. What's that going to end up being? It's x to the eighth. Very good. x to the third means we have three x's multiplied together. x to the fifth means we have five x's multiplied together. If I multiply them all together, now I have eight x's multiplied together. The shortcut, when we're multiplying exponents with the same variable as their base, we add the powers. So 3 plus 5 makes 8. So y to the 7th times y to the 12th would be y to the 19th, perfect. Why the 19th? Now we'll explore this a little bit more later, but negative powers like x to the 7th times x to the negative 3rd, we're still going to just add the powers. 7 plus negative 3 is just 4. So it's 7 to the 4, or x to the 4th. So if we go to multiply just single digit numbers, we might have 5x to the third y times 2xy squared. Now the variables here that don't have any powers on them, if it's easier, you can think of this as being y to the power of 1 and x to the power of 1. So we go to multiply, we're going to combine the counts. We're multiplying, so it's 5 times 2, which is 10. Ten. And then each name can be handled separately. x to the third times x is x to the it's 3 plus 1 is 4. Then it's going to be y to the third. third. Very good. Y, y times y squared is going to be 1 plus 2 makes 3. We can get a little bit more complicated. We get something like this. Now instead of just multiplying two single digit numbers, these are just two single digit numbers, 
It's one count and it's names. It's what we refer to as monomials. Now we are multiplying a single digit number, 3x, that's a monomial, times a two digit number. The technical term for that two digit number would be a binomial. By meaning two, so it has two digits, two names. To multiply that, there's a process, if you've had algebra or, or any sort of pre-algebra, you've probably seen it. But I'm going to show you the long way, the real way of doing it first. And then we'll come back and see that shortcut that you've most likely seen before. So if I had like 5 times 48. If I'm writing that out to do long multiplication, I would normally put the longer number, the number with the most digits on top, 48 times 5, like that. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to do the 2x plus 7 on top and the 3x on bottom. Notice I'm not worrying about lining up the 3x with the 2x because when I multiply, I do not need the same name. Then just like here, I'd do 5 times 8 and then 5 times 4. I'm going to do the same here. The difference is with the algebraic numbers, there's no carrying or borrowing. I don't have to worry about it. So 3x times 7 makes... What's 3 times 7? Just 21x. Very good. No x squared. It's just, just an x because there's no variable here to multiply by. Perfect. So now 3x times 2x, 6x squared. that is 6x squared. Perfect. Great job. Now you guys probably learned a shortcut called distributing. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you or not. What distributing is, it's just taking this here and shortening it up. Rather than writing it out, we're going to do it right in the... The parentheses here, we're just going to take the 3x and we're going to multiply each digit inside the parentheses. So it's 3x times the 2x is the 6x squared. <coughs> 3x times the 7 is the positive 21x. Notice it gives us the same answer and it just saves a little space. For the first, or for the next couple days of class, I'm probably going to keep doing it out the long way. But I will eventually switch over to doing the distributing just to, to make it shorter. <coughs> so we might have 7x squared times 3x squared minus 5x plus 11. So again... We're just going to write this out like long multiplication. I'm just going to put a dot here in 7x so it doesn't get confusing. 7x squared times 11 is 77x squared. Perfect, 77x squared. It's positive, so I'm going to put a plus in front of it. Now, 7x squared times a negative 5x. Negative 35x cubed. Negative 35x cubed. Great. 7x squared times 3x squared. Seven x squared times three x squared, guys. What's seven times three? Thirty-five. Careful. Twenty-one. Very good. X squared times x squared. X to the fourth. Very good. So we get twenty-one x to the fourth minus thirty-five x to the third plus seventy-seven x squared. Now, here's another 
fan favorite. So now we're going to multiply two binomials, two two-digit numbers. Now again, if we multiply two-digit numbers like 32 times 53, we set it up, 32, 53, and we just multiply. We do the 3 times the 2 and the 3 times the 3. We move over a spot, we do the 5 times the 2 and the 5 times the 3. We can do the exact same thing here. This is 3x plus 5 is the top number. 2x plus 3 is the bottom number, and we are multiplying. So it's 3 times 5 is positive 15. 3 times 3x, 9x. Now, just like here, when we moved over to the 5, we'd have to put in a 0 or something to hold the place. We've got to do the same here. We've got to put a 0 or move over a place. It's so now 2x times 5. 10x, positive 10x. Notice that stays lined up with the 9x. And 2x times 3x. 6x squared. Good. And now, just like we would have over here, we're going to add the columns. So 15 and 0 is just positive 15. 9x and 10x is 19x. 6x squared is just 6x squared. So it is 6x squared plus 19x plus 15. This is the long way, the actual way of multiplying this out. Now how many of you have had an algebra class or, an, or a pre-algebra class? Most of you have, okay. So we got 3x plus 5 times 2x plus 3. You guys probably saw a little thing called FOIL, right? All FOIL stood for, the F stood for first. That meant we did a shortcut. Rather than writing out the multiplication the long way and doing all this, we took a shortcut. We multiplied the first two digits. The 3x and the 2x make 6x squared. The O stood for, does anybody remember? Outside. outside, good. That meant we multiplied the outside two digits. So the 3x and the 3 are on the outside. 3x times 3 is a positive 9x. I stood for inside. So we multiplied the inside two digits. The 5 times the 2x is a positive 10x. And L stood for last. Good. So we multiply the last two digits. 5 times 3 is positive 15. And then we had to go back and combine like terms, the, the digits that have the same name, which is the positive 9x and the positive 10x. So the 6x squared stays the same. Positive 9, positive 10 makes a positive 19x and plus 15. It's the same answer and it is a lot shorter. Now, FOIL is an okay tool to have, but I think it's important to understand this longer process up here that we did for multiplying those because we can run into things like this. Three X minus two times five X squared minus seven X plus three. Foil doesn't cover this, does it? Now we got this middle digit here. Foil isn't going to cover it. To multiply this out, it would have to be Foyman oil. But if we use our long multiplication, I'm going to put the number with the most digits on top. It multiplies out just like any other number. So negative 2 times 3 is... Thank you. 
negative 6. Negative 2 times a negative 7x. Careful, the 14x is right, but a negative times a negative is positive. Negative 2 times 5x squared. Negative 10x squared, good. We move over to the 3x. We're going to put a 0 here. 3x times 3. Positive 9x. So 9x. 3x times negative 7x. Negative 21x squared, good. 3x times 5x squared. Fifteen x cubed, or fifteen x to the third. Good job. So we got negative six and zero is negative six. Fourteen x and nine x is a twenty three x. Negative ten and negative twenty one is negative thirty one x squared, and fifteen x to the third. Now, yes, I do realize you could adjust foil, so you could have used foil on this by just. Adding the extra steps in it when you multiply. If that's the way you've, you've learned how to do it and you like doing it that way, please feel free to keep doing it that way. I, will, I won't stop you. I just want to make sure you've seen the real way to multiply polynomials. <coughs> okay, let's take a look then at dividing. If I have x to the fifth divided by x squared... x to the fifth, again, is 5x's multiplied together. x squared is two of them. If I'm thinking about fractions, remember in fractions I can divide out common factors in the numerator and denominator. So I can divide out an x. I can divide out another x. And I'm left with x to the third. What happens when we're dividing exponents that have the same base is we can subtract the powers. 5 minus 3, or 5 minus 2, gives us the 3. So if I have y to the 13th divided by y to the 10th, what do I get? y to the 3rd, good. <coughs> if I add numbers into this, like 12z to the 8th divided by 4z to the 2nd. Just like with multiplication, I combine the counts first. What's 12 divided by 4? 3, good. z to the 8th divided by z squared. Careful. 8 minus 2 is... 6, z to the 6. Very good. I can have more than one variable with it. I might have 28 x to the 5th, y to the 3rd, divided by 7 x squared, y squared. I divide the number. What is 28 divided by 7? Four, good. Then I can do each variable separately. X to the fifth divided by X squared. X to the third. X to the third, good. Five minus two is three. And then Y to the... Three minus two is one, right? So Y to the one or just Y. So I'm going to have you try one of these in your notes real quick. 36, x to the fifth, y to the eighth, z, divided by 4, x to the third, y to the third, z. See what you come up with there. I'll give you about a minute to figure that one out.
So what is 36 divided by 4? 9. Good. X to the power of? 2. 2. Good. 5 minus 3 is 2. Y to the? 5th. 5th. Good. 8 minus 3 is 5. What happens to Z? Z cancels out. It divides out. Just like if we had two measurements, like if we had something that was 28 inches long and we're dividing it into pieces that are 4 inches long, the inches divide out. 28 divided by 4 is 7. So our answer is not 7 inches. It's just 7 pieces. Now, we could get into larger numbers divided by larger numbers, but the furthest we're going to take it is this. I'm going to, let's look at a multi-digit whole number. 846 divided by 2. When I do that division, 2 goes into 8 how many times? 4. Good. There's nothing left over. So 2 goes into 4. Twice, nothing left over. Two goes into six. Three times. Three times. So when there's no remainders in each of those digits, we just take each digit divided by the two or whatever number we're dividing by. So for what we're going to be doing with our division, we're going to keep it that simple. We might have 15x to the third plus 9x squared minus... 12x. And we'll be dividing this by. This, oops, come on. Dividing this by 3x. Now we could leave it like this, or it's easier for me if I write it like this. With the 3x down below like this, divided by 3x. And just like I did here, I took each digit divided by the 2. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to take each digit divided by the 3x. So 15x to the third divided by 3x. What is 15 divided by 3? 5. x to the third divided by x? x squared. Good. 9x squared divided by 3x. 9 divided by 3 is positive 3. Just x. x squared divided by x is just x. Think of this as 2 minus 1 is 1 or just x. Negative 12x divided by 3. Negative 12. Bless you. Negative 12 divided by 3 is a negative 4. How about the x? It cancels out. Good. So that divides to give us 5x squared plus 3x minus 14. I'm thinking you guys have probably heard about enough of my voice for the day. You're not supposed to act so happy about me being done. In the big book. <laughs> Pages 333 to 334. Exercise 13, 2. Pages 335 through 336. Exercise 13 3. On page 339 to 340. Exercise 13 4. And finally, page 342 